What a pleasure to be here, 24th Music Festival. How many of you are here for the first time? A lot of hands, okay. You're in for a real treat. My first time was about uh, maybe 12 years ago. I got a note uh, inviting me to give a keynote here even then, and I was stunned. I'd never heard of Staglin. I didn't know what this, whether this was a music festival or a wine tasting or a great dinner. Was it a party? a celebration or a science meeting. I went on the website, didn't get a lot of clarity about that, but I did see that the person who had been at this meeting the previous year was Eric Kandel in that same role. And I thought, wow, how they have fallen that they've invited me to follow Eric. He had just won the Nobel Prize and was a giant in the field. But uh, I decided maybe I should at least check with him. So I called him and... Uh, asked, uh, what's this thing about the Staglin Festival? What is this? And there was a moment of silence, and then he gave out this very eccentric laugh. Any of you who know him knows he has the most unusual laugh on the planet. And then he said, Ensel, it's the greatest gig of the year. Do it. <laughs> Which is true. But what he didn't tell me was it's also one of the greatest gifts of the year. Now, this is such a special opportunity not only to meet the scientists, but to meet other people who are on the same journey, uh, and to figure out a way to contribute. Because what we really care about, most of all, is solutions. And what I want to talk to you about in the next few minutes is first defining the problem, what's the problem we're trying to solve, and how we might be able to do that, not in 50 years, but in the next five to 10 years. From my perspective, the problem breaks down in really two ways. First of all, we've got a set of illnesses which have very high disability, we call that morbidity, and they are deadly, we call that mortality. But what's really distressing is that in spite of everything we've done, there's no good evidence at the population level that we've been able to bend the curve on either morbidity or mortality. I'll show you what those numbers look like real quickly. This is a measure of how we look at disability. It's put together by a group in Seattle funded by the Gates Foundation called the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And the red bars show you the amount of disability for mental health and for neurological disorders that together represent about a third of all disability in the United States of all ages. That is distressing, but what's more distressing is that those numbers actually are worse than they would have been 20 years ago. We're going in the wrong direction. And the same thing is true for mortality. When you look at suicide, the rate of suicide is actually not going down, like homicide and like um, deaths from traffic fatalities. It's going up about 24% since 1995. That's not good news. And if you look at the actual numbers, 45,000 people dying of suicide in 2016, the last year that the CDC reports on, that number, just to give you some context, is greater than the number of deaths from breast cancer, prostate cancer, and virtually all forms of childhood cancer put together. It's almost double, or it's more than double the rate of uh, homicide deaths, it's more by about double than the number of deaths from traffic fatalities. Extraordinary. So what this tells you is not just that we've got a massive problem of disability and death, but that whatever we're doing doesn't seem to be working. Maybe we need a bigger boat. Maybe we need more money. Maybe we need better ideas. But the question I think we should be asking ourselves is, why have we failed? And I've thought a lot about that. And I'll give you what I think are four possible explanations. They're probably not the entire list, but they're four that I think we can attack in the short term. One is that our diagnostic system is badly broken relative to what we do today for cancer, for endocrine diseases, for heart disease. We do not make, we don't have anything that looks like precision medicine here for mental illness. Another is that the, that the largest fraction of people with mental illness, even with severe mental illness, are not in treatment. They're out there suffering, but they're not people that we count, they're not people that we see, they're not people that we help. 
Third issue is that when we do help people, we do a very poor job of it, generally. We have a system, if you want to call it that, that's very fragmented. There's no connection between hospital care and post-hospital care. There's no preemptive or preventive strategy. There's no accountability for issues like suicide, the way there is for traffic fatalities or for homicides in most counties and states. And what we do is entirely reactive. We see people when they come to us. Finally, we have an enormous problem with measurement. Unlike any other area of medicine, we don't measure what we do. So we often don't even know with whether what we're doing is working or not. As Peter Drucker said in the context of talking about business, we don't manage what we don't measure. And unfortunately, that's very true here as well. So how do we fix this? What can we do about this? I'm going to suggest to you that in a strange way, the solutions are sort of in this room. You'll hear from some people later today, later this afternoon, who are going to talk to you about the power of neuroscience and the power of genomics and what those incredible revolutionary technologies can begin to do to bend this curve. I'm going to talk about a third revolution, which has to do with technology and information science. And I'm going to suggest that if we're looking for changes in the next five years or the next three years, this might be where they could be found. And they could be found because the revolution here has already happened. If you look at these numbers, the increase in smartphones, the in, for better or for worse, the use of Facebook, YouTube, Google, it's an extraordinary period. And perhaps the most consequential issue here is the bottom line, which is a new system for analytics that allows us to use the power of both big data and powerful computing to get new insights statistically, a technique called machine learning. Now, of all those things, perhaps the most immediately useful for us is going to be the first one, the smartphone, which amazingly, hard to believe this, but is essentially better than the supercomputers that we had in the early 1990s. The Cray-2 supercomputer, which you can see here, was a, actually had less memory, less RAM, less speed, and it weighed a hell of a lot more. In fact, it had to have its own cooling system. Any of you who are complaining about the cost of the new iPhone, check out the Cray-2. Now, what's great about this is not only that it's a supercomputer that we all have in our pockets, and some of us are using them right now as I speak, but these are found everywhere in the world already. This is a global technology that already exists. What we worry about with so many of the things that we develop in medicine is that we won't have a way to get them out there to everyone. This one's already out there, three billion current users. And the problem isn't that they don't use them, the problem is they use them too much. This is actually, in terms of mental health, more often a source of problem than a source of solution. What we want to do is to change that narrative by taking a technology that's already more ubiquitous than clean water, is used more often than almost anything else that people do. It's where people live today. It's your whole life now is represented on this phone, and that, of course, gives us a window into how the brain is working. Unfortunately, what we're generally doing in this field looks very different, right? We've got subjective, episodic, clinical-based measures, and all of which are high burden. This is what we need. And what we're trying to do then is to use the phone and all of the attributes of that phone to begin to get a different picture of how people are functioning. Some of them are obvious. They're the sensors like activity and GPS. There's voice and speech, obvious. What we do is a little different. We look at the actual use of the keyboard. Our founder, a fellow named Paul Dagum, was in cybersecurity. And he developed a method to track hackers by looking not at what you type, but how you type. This is a way of looking at the taps, the scrolls, the clicks. And by using the power of machine learning and learning from what we see in clinical ratings, we can begin to identify those features of the phone and it's how it's used that tell us something about how somebody's doing in the real world. I'm going to run through this because we don't have a lot of time, but simply to say that we've got about 1,000 potential biomarkers off the phone. And again, it's not listening into what somebody says. It's not looking at what they type. 
It's taking this odd thing about how you type as the source of information. Does it work? It works pretty well. In Paul's first study where he looked at a bunch of people who had gold standard neuropsychological testing, he found the features that would map almost precisely onto individual scores on tests like verbal memory and um, cognitive control. Pretty extraordinary. So it was useful not only for cognitive traits, but we could use it for mood states as well. Because what this was able to do, if we looked at people being treated with an antidepressant, as they got better and got worse and got better and got worse again, 10 different subjects followed for months at a time, the features on the phone told us when somebody was getting depressed or when they were getting better. And ultimately, they looked like they could be used to predict those changes as well. So for the first time, we've got exactly what we've been looking for. We have ways of measuring that are objective, that are continuous, they're ecological, they don't require coming to the clinic, and amazingly, they're all passive. They don't require filling out forms or doing anything other than using your phone, which all of us do way too much. Now, this kind of technology is already being deployed in a big study with one mind and the group at UNC called the Aurora Project. Many of you heard about this last year from Sam McLean, who's here again this year. It's a fantastic study to look at 5,000 people who've had a traumatic event, following them for uh, 18 months to look at the development of PTSD or other post-traumatic syndromes. And what this gives us then is continuous deep insights about how they're responding in the months after a traumatic event for the first time giving us a picture of who's at high risk for PTSD. The other beautiful thing about this platform of the smartphone that's so ubiquitous is that it can be used not only to measure, as I've just been telling you with this digital phenotyping, but it can be used to deliver treatments. And those can be done on this very same device, whether those are psychotherapies or whether they're aspects of care management that allow you to do a better job in the very fragmented system we have today for clinical care, creating a closed loop, or what we call a learning engine, that we can allow to provide much better care. The MindStrong effort does this through a sort of uh, electronic dashboard that sits on the phone that helps a care manager know how to deliver care and to know who to call when they have a list of 200 subjects, who are the top five that are gonna need their attention. Others have used the same platform for early intervention for suicide. Crisis text line is out there knowing that young people don't use the phone to call, they use the phone to text, so they've created this 24-7 spectacular access system for anybody who's suicidal. Seven Cups, another company that's represented here today, remarkable uh, effort to take the, the impact of something like Alcoholics Anonymous, peer support, and to put that, to sort of marry that to Facebook, to put that in together with social media, creating a global platform that provides online peer support 24-7, creating communities that own, not only give a person a chance to get care when they need it, but to also give care, which turns out to be often as therapeutic as anything else that we know. So, what I want to suggest to you is that we have a chance here to really make a difference on all of those aspects that have kept us from bending the curve. The diagnostics, the lack of engagement, the problems with quality, and of course, as I've just said, the lack of measurement. Um, it's not going to be simple, it's not going to be maybe a one-year project, but this is something that will happen over the next five years if we get it right. And getting it right means two things, showing that it works, not only that you can do it in clinical studies, but it really changes the practice of psychiatry and gives us better outcomes, both in primary care and outside of the normal care pathway. But more important than that is getting public trust. We live in an era where we call the tech lash, where everybody's concerned about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. We have had bad actors in the social media space. The wonderful thing about Seven Cups and about other companies that are trying to change that narrative is they want to use the same powerful tools as a social good. But that requires transparency, agency, responsibility, or as we say often when we try to think about what's really going to make the difference here, it's finding a way to empower patients and families with better information. 
That's our goal. That's the journey. And we're so excited to be able to share this with you here and hope that many of you will join us as we try to transform mental health care using the best of new technology. Thank you.